Welcome everybody to another episode of the Nonprofit Show. We have one of our favorite people here today, LaShonda Williams, one of the superstar trainers with Fundraising Academy. And we were just chatting in the green room uh, that it's LaShonda and I work together, but only on camera. And she, she got to the opportunity to actually meet IRL in real life, Jarrett Ransom, uh, the nonprofit nerd at AFP Icon. And uh, so it, it's really an interesting way that we've formed relationships. Um, Fundraising Academy at National University is all about relationships. And so this is such an interesting time that we've navigated through and we're still navigating through, wouldn't you say, LaShonda? Oh, absolutely. Um, we're still doing hybrid events. My colleagues are across the U.S. and country at times. So it is very interesting. Um, we forge really great relationships online, but to me, there's nothing like being face to face. So AFP Icon created that opportunity for us to strengthen our relationships with our partners and for us as a team to get together and spend some quality time. And it was absolutely spectacular. I'm so glad. I'm real. I'm just thrilled. Well, we had a wonderful time, and um, we are very, very fortunate that one of our big sponsors, Bloomerang, um, actually had us in their booth, and we broadcast uh, from their booth for two days. And so, um, we, again, we want to thank them because that that's a big that's a big give to to give a valuable, expensive real estate on a convention floor uh, to somebody to do something else and so we are very very appreciative as we are with all of our presenting sponsors and they include american nonprofit academy your part-time controller nonprofit thought leader fundraising academy at national university staffing boutique nonprofit nerd and nonprofit tech talk again you know we say this day in and day out but these are the folks that allow us to have these amazing conversations and fundraising academy has really stepped up to lend us their talent every Friday to help answer and, and navigate the questions that come in. LaShonda, it's really interesting. Now that I'm going out to things, I was at a very large public event um, on Tuesday, Tuesday or Wednesday at breakfast. I'm not so good in the morning, so I can't remember which day it was. But you know, I had a couple people that came up to me during that breakfast that said, hey, can you get this question on your show? So, you know, in the beginning with the pandemic, people were just emailing or typing in, you know, during a show. But uh, I, I mentioned this to Jarrett and she said the same thing as she's going out. People are saying, hey, would you put this question up for me? So um, it's really an interesting thing how we're navigating this. You know, again, all of our broadcasts come to uh our community through streaming through podcasts but now we have a really cool thing and that's a new app and so you can take an image if you're watching this um, live or through one of our archives you can scan this code and we'll get you set up so that you never miss any of the information that we're pushing out it's really fun and I want to also thank our team here at American Nonprofit Academy uh, led by Kevin Pace they did this amazing technology and we are super excited about it. Okay, my friend, talk to us about cultivating and cultivate 2023. Cultivate 2023 is the conference at the nonprofit, I'm sorry, that the Fundraising Academy is putting on June 1st. It is our first conference. We will feature a variety of talent across the San Diego, California area, along with our keynote speaker, Ken Miller who will bring a variety of information and will talk throughout the day about how to cultivate relationships um, from the nonprofit perspective. We have two tracks, one for those um, who may be new to fundraising or in the middle of their career. We'll also have another track for leadership. So anything and everything that you want, one-stop shopping all day long. It'll be an opportunity to engage with other individuals in the philanthropic sector, to learn from each other, to grow from each other, and also to network among each other to strengthen our professional relationships so that we can create our own community of practice as we cultivate new relationships. I love it. Well, we will be there. The nonprofit show will be there. We'll be broadcasting live for two days. Um, you know, your event is on a Thursday, but on Friday is our general, we generally do our ask and answer episode. And so I, I think we're trying to figure out 
how we're going to convene, but we've um, been thinking about doing more like a panel discussion. And um, so that's to be determined, but uh, we are very, very excited at the nonprofit show to be there and be a part of this. Um, you can scan this QR code. Again, if you're watching this live or through one of our archives, um, go ahead and scan that and that will link you in. If you are hearing this on podcast, uh, go ahead and go to fundraising-academy.org and you can learn more about that, navigate through their website. It's going to be a really great opportunity. And hey, I got to say, it's not just because I live in the desert, but going to San Diego in the heat of the summer, always a good choice. Always a good choice. And you'll always be surrounded by good people. Yes, absolutely. And you're going to get to meet LaShonda if you show up. Okay. Oh, this is crazy. Somebody from San Diego has written in a question. <laughs> okay. Jerry writes, I want to join my local AFP chapter, and I feel that my nonprofit should pay the dues. However, this is not flying well with my executive director. Am I wrong thinking this is a bad decision, and should I just suck it up and pay the dues myself? Please advise. You know, we've had this question, something similar like this about professional designations. We, we get these questions every now and again. What do you think, LaShonda? So there are a variety of different layers. And so let's kind of first start with the first layer. And, and me thinking about AFP is, is phenomenal. The affiliation is important and it's paramount to your professional development and adds value to your organization as you're maintaining high standards and you are being immersed into current trends. Oh, and true. local chapters offer a variety of ongoing professional development for which obviously your organization will benefit. Mm -hmm. However, as a professional development person, uh, development professional, I ask you, did you provide your full case for support? Wow, you're a so, taskmaster. <laughs> so let's first start with what your case for support was. Okay. And then, and you know, with with the, the fundraising academy in the cost selling cycle, we talk about overcoming objections. And so this is an opportunity to transition that objection into an opportunity. So did you, Jerry, in fact, ask your executive director follow-up open-ended questions? Is there something that I haven't provided you? Is there more information? Um, what can I share with you to convince you? You know, ask additional questions so that you'll know what that factor is that has a, a led the executive director to derive at the current no that is still a possible yes. And then I will also say, that when it comes to professional development, it's really important that we as development professionals are also willing to invest in ourselves. Yeah. When organizations offer the memberships, that is a wonderful added benefit for obviously which they'll benefit from. There's great ROI. However, at the same time, you also have to be willing to invest in yourself. And I say that from personal experience, um, when I was going through my CFRE process, my organization paid for several professional development opportunities. When it was time for me to take the exam, I didn't even ask them to, you know, to pay for the exam because they'd invested so much in me through the years. And I paid for my CFRE exam out of pocket. And for some people, you know, they say, well, LaShonda, you should have had your organization do that. I did it because I wanted to invest in myself. And it's no different from when you ask donors to invest in your organizations. The cultivation begins within. And so by me willing to invest in myself, I, I will reap the long-term benefits. The organization reaps the benefit. And it also demonstrates an, an act of good faith and gratitude that I appreciate that which you've invested in me. And so I'm going to take it one step further and invest in myself as well. So there's multiple things to think about, Jerry. There's not a true right or wrong answer, but it creates an opportunity to overcome the objection. Okay, so you you blow my mind every time we're together on the, on the nonprofit show because I would have never, ever, ever, but I love it, I would have never taken the link because in my mind right now, I'm seeing the cause selling um, cycle um uh, I call it an icon, but really it's that graph. It, it's mm -hmm. it's that process 
Um, and I love that you wove in the concept because what that tells me, Lashonda, is that you're, you're living this process and you're looking at your life, not just with donors, but the, the ecosystem of philanthropy and saying, how does this work? And that was super cool because I would have never, ever thought of that. And I love that because the more you look at life doing that process, the more natural I've got to believe it becomes. Exactly. And that contributes to the authenticity that your donors will see because you are living it. You are manifesting it on an ongoing basis. It's not just in the workplace. These are principles that are applicable to you as a fundraising professional in your personal life as well and your personal career as you're growing. Right. So, you know, my my thought when I read this, um, Jerry, is that so I thought of this in a completely different way. I thought of it as we are all struggling to find talent. And when you go to AFP meetings or any AFP engagements, heck, AFP icon in New Orleans, you get to meet people that maybe you can work with or that can maybe deliver business to you or you can partner with or it's it's a opportunity for, I don't know, more engagement. Does that make Growth, sense? Growth, engagement. It's yeah. an opportunity to cultivate new relationships. Yeah. It's an opportunity to discover opportunities, leads, prospects. Yeah. Um, there are a plethora of benefits. The question is, how convincing was your case for support? Bottom line. Bottom line. I love, love, love that. And Jerry, I hope that you don't feel like we've just like smacked you upside the head. <laughs> you should have done this. But I, I love, to me, when with your response is like, man, you're walking the walk. That's super cool. Okay, Jerry, go back and and do what LaShonda said and, and do this case for support. And you know what? It might not be a bad idea to say, this is how I work with donors. And this is how I, you know, communicate and try and build consensus. I don't know. I love it. Um, really cool. LaShonda, that was so good. I don't even know if you can be able, if you can top that answer, but let's move on to city withheld, name withheld. Um, We've had a similar question to this in the past, uh, or questions. Uh, and to me, when I when I read this question, I was thinking about um, the sanctity of the relationship and the personal communication that we often have with our donors. And so the question goes like this, and I, I, I'm gonna tell you, I did take off this person's name uh, because I didn't, I, I just thought, it was the right thing to do. So um, this woman, it was a woman, wrote, help, I just had a donor who is a significant donor in my portfolio. Call me up and ask my thoughts about another nonprofit. I was totally caught off guard and did not know what to do. I told them that I re really did not have any information, but that I would ask around. I'm in a tough spot here. It's kind of like spying or, you know, <laughs> I, I mean, what did you think when, what do you think about this? That is definitely uh, in a tough spot, but the first and foremost thing you want to think about is ethics as a professional development, as a fundraising professional. Uh, we never give any disparaging information out or share anything disparaging about another organization. The fact that the donor has contacted you directly and asked about another organization, it speaks to the strength of the relationship. Yeah. Apparently he or she feels very comfortable with speaking with you, which is great. That means that your relationship is strong. And it's also an opportunity for you to ask additional questions. You know, do you mind at sharing, you know, what a, what is it about this organization that has you curious? And it's an opportunity for you to discover why they're interested in when the, the donor shares their interest and the reason for their interest. It's also an opportunity for you to tie in how your organization supports or satisfies that interest that they're inquiring about with the other organization. So you want to ask additional questions. Don't jump the gun. Don't be disparaging. Um, it's an opportunity to strengthen your relationship, to learn more about the donor, whether or not they're considering making a contribution to that organization. What we do know is that donor have choices and there's a donor bill of rights. And you want to make sure that you're very respectful of that. And again, as a professional, 
don't be disparaging about another organization. Provide what you can, but you're necess not necessarily going to be their prospect researcher on that particular organization. You know, I, I agree with you. I mean, I feel like my first reaction was, this means they trust you and they know that you're on the inside of, an, of a vibrant community and in the philanthropic, you know, health and recommendations um, that this donor's searching, they're strong. My other, my other piece is not so generous. And that is my first reaction would be like, crap, they're going to spend less money with me. You know, I mean, I hate to say it, but I, you know, and I know that's the scarcity mentality and I know that's the wrong way to think, but heartfelt and honestly, my first reaction was like, you know, I'm going to say you, funny. I give credence to your first reaction because of course that's the first <laughs> thing that's going to come to mind. However, this particular donor being a significant donor, it is not uncommon for donors to have a diverse portfolio when it comes to philanthropic support. And so because you have a strong relationship with the donor and you've been cultivating and engaging them throughout that time, that trust is there. And I'm certain whatever endeavors he or she has been supporting, he'll continue to support. And in fact, when you share information about another opportunity, um, and I'm using that word loosely, you never know the donor may, you know, may, it could be a test and the donor could wow. still say, okay, thank you for sharing this information. I've looked up this organization and I really want, I've decided that I'm going to support your organization even more because you add more value because your program differs, but we want to respect donors having the option. And uh, we want to also be supportive of each other as we're all in the nonprofit sector and we're trying to advance all of our causes. Yeah. Yeah. It's real. It's very interesting man i hope we hear back on how that went i'm and definitely the, curious on that yeah, outcome and the choices uh, that she made i i'm, I'm really intrigued because it's it, it's interesting okay jeffrey from new york writes in i'm a board chair and have asked our members to bring us some new candidates with different talents this has been such a challenge they keep bringing the same types of people to the table basically they are not helping us to build diversity in a strong talent base any suggestions? <laughs> this is absolutely timely, Jeffrey. I appreciate that question. Um, AFP Advancing Philanthropy, April 2023 20, edition. I um, I do have a submission supercharging your board, your fundraising board, and I speak specifically to that that point, which is creating opportunity to diversify um, the board, looking at a variety of different demographics. Um, from the typical demographic groups where you're looking at race, religion, age, but taking it one step beyond and thinking about those that are representative of the community that you serve, um, those that have that are un in untraditional spaces and creating an opportunity in a space that supports diversity, equity, and inclusion by granting access and also providing the necessary training because granting access and diversifying your board, but not necessarily providing that foundational training does not create an environment to, that you can sustain and that you can grow and promote success. Right. So definitely um, look at your board demographic, have really meaningful conversations, look at, check out the article and try to apply some of those principles mm -hmm. and also talk to your board about what are their strong skill sets and what are some skill sets that we're currently missing? And let's really be intentional in identifying individuals that will bridge those 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 holes that we have in in our in our in our community. I, I think you're exactly right. We we created a board assessment um, tool with, at the American Nonprofit Academy years I mean years ago, and probably. 10, 15 years ago. And it, it we've changed it over the years. And I, I think people are like, you know, everybody, we need more board members because Joe's leaving and yada, yada. And I think what happens is the board members like look around at their table, their circle and say, well, you know, Betty would be a great choice and Raul would be a better choice or whatever. And we don't look at, to your point, what it is we need. You know, maybe this is a board that needs an HR professional or an attorney 
or a physician or somebody that can lend a voice to a certain topic that is not being heard, right? Or is not being accessed. Um, exactly. And so yeah. you have to have candid conversations with the board. And that may mean that board member referrals uh, may not uh, necessarily, your, your recruitment process may not necessarily be limited to just board member referrals. Perhaps there are individuals within the community space that are not directly connected to board members. And that is an opportunity to engage your community in a very meaningful way. Um, and in many instances, unfortunately, boards can become homogeneous because oh, yeah. people you know, associate in the same circles with consistency. Yeah. And so if you're looking to diversify, that means you have to look outside of that space that is your norm. Uh, and so you have to be very intentional with that. Yeah, I, and I think you're right. You know, we we have our little tribes and then we just kind of, you know, swim in that same pond. And so for a lot of people, it's a big like aha moment to say it's not just another body, it's the right type of body, right? It's Exactly. Right, it's the right person and the right fit. And uh so I think I, I, you know, maybe I'm a Pollyanna, but man, I think your board wants to do right by their mission. They just I definitely think help. so. Yeah. I want to, I want to be on the half full yeah, and, and have, you know, optimism that the board wants the organization to continue to grow and that they want it to be viable. They want it to be diverse, but perhaps you need to really define what diversity means. Mm -hmm. I agree. And what that looks like for your organization. And again, you know, Julia, like you said, looking at various types of professions, because you'll have a heightened level of expertise, the more experts that you have at the table, the, the better you can do with prudent decision making on behalf of your organization and creating plans that are sustainable, meaningful and impactful. You know, one of my biggest lessons was uh, working with a nonprofit who served, uh, you know, I live in the Southwest, who, who whose main function was to serve um, the Hispanic community. And on their board, they did not have one person that could speak Spanish. And I was like, what, what? <laughs> I mean, you know, wow. So it's, I mean, just the linguistics, just a language issue. So it's not always just about, you know, race and gender. It exactly. Goes it goes beyond. A lot, yeah, a lot of things. So anyway, okay, well, that was a good question. And I, I really hope that Jeffrey in New York um, can can navigate that into some better solutions. Holy cow, New York City is like super diverse. So you shouldn't have that problem. Now, our next question comes from Lincoln, Nebraska, not as diverse. And it, this is interesting, LaShonda, because this comes from a group of people. And they wrote in to us and said, how do you feel about having our board members be required to fundraise? We are thinking about a specific number and adding it to our board member policies. We are in the discovery phase of this decision and fear the outcome once this goes before, before our board, board for a vote. It's, it's an interesting question. It, <laughs> it is a very interesting yeah. question. Um, it's springtime. Organizations are starting to uh, renew, amplify, looking at their strategic plans, their organizational goals, and, and structure for success. With that in mind, culture philanthropy begins within the organization. Mm -hmm. And so I think that it's important to be very authentic with the board and talking about the mission, the goals, objectives that are currently in place and how their financial support is an integral part of that. Mm -hmm. And their support is an endorsement and um, a demonstration of their commitment beyond being physically present and being a part of the decision-making process. Right. And I think with the right um, information, the right case for support, that it shouldn't be um, foreign to them. You never know. Uh, one of the things that uh, comes up often in the philanthropic space is the number one reason why people haven't given is because they haven't been asked. Right. And we cannot be afraid right. to ask our boards to participate um, in fundraising and in instances where boards may not necessarily board members may not necessarily have um, the expendable cash, then perhaps they can be responsible for providing referrals to solicit X said amount of dollars mm -hmm. as their participation for, for the, re the requirement for funding. So there are a variety of ways to increase in 
include the board in the fundraising process, whether it be actual cash at hand or referrals or a combination approach. You'll have to, you know, have a conversation with the board to find out what, what and where you can meet in the middle and be very transparent about the needs of the organization and that their commitment as a volunteer is greatly appreciated, but it is their philanthropic support that ensures that the organization is able to sustain its mission and continue forward with the work. You know, LaShonda, I'm seeing a lot of uh, grant portals, and you probably are too, asking the question, do you have 100% financial participation with your board? And it's not like, you know, at what level or what dollar amount, but it's just to your point, is everyone giving? It might only be a hundred bucks, but do you have a hundred percent philanthropic and financial support of your board? And that's not that is bad. important. Yeah. And you know, and depending on the types of gifts you're soliciting, when you're when you're cultivating larger donors or preparing for a capital or comprehensive campaign, they want to know who are the supporters. Yeah. Uh, you know, I can recall working in uh, in a, in another institution. And we were seeking opportunities to secure larger gifts from corporations and from foundations. And you're right, that was the first question. It was at a higher ed institution. The first question that they asked our foundation was how many of your alumni are currently supporting your organization? How many donors do you have? And again, the culture of philanthropy begins within the institution and then it spurs outside of it. And it starts with having that conversation with your board members and then your staff members and then leading out into the community. And there's nothing better than a donor to hear that 100% of the staff members do support the organization. It's that magic. Means, yeah. Exactly. You know, there's a difference between you're a major stakeholder and you want to demonstrate your commitment beyond that professional service that you're providing, that you're being compensated for. I used to manage faculty staff giving, and with faculty staff giving, we had coordinators and divisions all across the, or the organization. And it starts with, as a coordinator, you are required and expected to be a donor. And so, and, and then they're able to connect with those that they're soliciting. I support the giving campaign and please join me. Yeah. I've already made my gift. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when you're asking the broader community to support you, it's important to say that our board, we have 100% board participation. Mm -hmm. And so that just, it solidifies the organization. It provides financial stability. It's another revenue stream. There are nothing but pluses associated with board financial support. Well, speaking of gifts, LaShonda Williams, a trainer with extraordinary, I'm going to add extraordinaire, trainer, <laughs> extraordinaire at Fundraising Academy um, that's based at National University. LaShonda Williams, you are such a great mind in our sector. And shoot, I'm glad that you're in the nonprofit sector and not in pharmaceuticals or automobile sales or something else because you are great and i've always learned something from you and at the same time always, i'm always very encouraged and so um what what a joy to have you on another episode of the nonprofit show we have lashonda coming back to a two-day drill down with us in the next couple of weeks specifically talking about ways to thank donors it's fascinating it's not your regular deal that we all know and and uh, have fall back on so i encourage you to, to to check us out and we'll be talking about that even more again lashonda williams one of the great trainers at fundraising academy we're also very grateful for our sponsors that come to us come with us i should say every day and they include bloomerang american nonprofit academy your part-time controller nonprofit thought leader fundraising academy at national university Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Nerd, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. These are the folks that are with us day in and day out. Okay, LaShonda, you have empowered me and excited me no end to get going. Have a great weekend, Julie. It's always a pleasure to be with you, and I'm looking forward to sharing more. And best wishes to all of my fellow development professionals. All right. Thank you so much, everybody. Hey, as we like to end every episode, we want to remind everyone to stay well so you can do well. We'll see you back here again. Thanks so much, LaShonda.